Welcome back, everybody, to the NCAA Next Up Dynasty here on NCAA Football 14. Today, we will be resuming the college football playoff. Last episode, we had the first round of the playoff, and in case you missed that, I'll leave a card at the top right of your screen so you can go ahead and check that out. Today, we'll be going over all of the second round games, of course, with the 12-team playoff now in effect. We are now down to eight teams. So this is what the bracket looks like as of now with Oklahoma, California, Florida, and Oregon all winning their games in the last episode and moving on. You may notice each game today has a major bowl game. That is because all of the quarterfinal games will be played at major bowl game sites. And these are the games that these teams selected. They were based on the seedings. So, for example, Clemson, being the number one overall seed, got their choice of the four bowl games. They chose the Orange Bowl. Ohio State then got the next pick. They chose the Rose Bowl. TCU chose the Fiesta Bowl. And then Middle Tennessee State was given the Sugar Bowl. So let's not waste any time. Let's get this show on the road, shall we? Let's get things started here in the Fiesta Bowl between the number three seeded TCU Horned Frogs and the number six seeded California Golden Bears for a spot in the semifinals. Let's start with Cal. These guys were the big underdog going into the college football playoff. The only reason why they got in was because they won the Pac-12 championship game, but they utterly dominated against Notre Dame in the first round, winning 35-3. Cal has been playing their best football over the last month, and it showed as they completely annihilated the Fighting Irish. And seeing how well Cal played in that game, I think they can match up with just about anybody in the entire country. Sophomore quarterback Rufus Motley was unbelievable throwing the football. They've got a great run game. Their defense was phenomenal against Notre Dame. Now, unfortunately for them, their star running back, Marquette Collins, broke his hand late in the Notre Dame game and will be out today. Let's now talk about the TCU Horned Frogs. They won the Big 12. They got a first-round bye, so this is our first look at them here in the college football playoff. TCU is a very interesting story because they had no expectations going into the year, and sure enough, they ended up being one of the best teams in college football, going 12-1. and They handled Missouri in the conference championship, and the fascinating storyline about this team is the quarterback position. They had a young, talented starter in Cade Brown, who was pretty good last year as a sophomore, but for whatever reason, they turned the QB job over to Sterling Yorkshire this year. Nobody saw that coming, but it has completely paid off. Yorkshire was a finalist for the Heisman Trophy and has led TCU to the number three seed. They've got plenty of playmakers on offense, and their defense is really good as well. The time is now for TCU to win a championship because 10 of their 11 defensive starters are seniors. They're a very old group, so they've got a lot of experience, and if they really want to win this thing, now would be the time to do so. I think this is going to be a pretty exciting game, and I'll say this now. The games of the last episode were pretty exciting, but the four games you're going to see today were all even better. So I think you guys are in for a treat. Get comfortable, get your popcorn, get a snack, because it's going to be fun. Let's start with the Fiesta Bowl here at the University of Phoenix Stadium, home of the Arizona Cardinals. You may notice TCU is number 8, Cal is number 10. Those rankings do not mean anything. I had to set some stuff up in different save files to get all of these games working, but the rosters and whatnot are the exact same. So don't worry about the rankings. Don't worry about the scores on the bottom. The only thing that really matters is that these two teams are playing against each other with the correct rosters. Cal opening up with the football. As I briefly mentioned earlier, they'll be without their star running back, Marquette Collins, today. So Harrison Myers will be taking most of the load, and he starts off strong with a quick hand of 24. Myers, a sophomore, has been the change of pace back for Cal this year. He's done a pretty good job, but now is being thrusted into a bigger role. Rufus Motley with a good run up the middle. He threw the ball excellently against Notre Dame last episode, but he is more of a runner than a thrower at this stage in his career. Second and two, the tight end Pichette in motion. Motley keeps it on the read option and is in for a touchdown. So California gets right back to work from the Notre Dame game. A quick start for the Golden Bear offense. They lead 7-0. Let's take a look at TCU featuring the senior quarterback Sterling Yorkshire as he fumbles it. It's picked up quickly by the left tackle Tyree Sanders. But that was on a third down and Yorkshire lost a few yards. So that'll force a punt. Really good start here for Cal. Can they keep it going on this drive as the pass short is caught by Sean Whitmore? 
He is wrapped up out of bounds past the 50. So far, just like the Notre Dame game, Cal is starting off fantastic. Now a third and six here for the Golden Bears. We'll see if their offense can keep moving it. Play action fake. Motley dances in the pocket, goes downfield, and it's picked off. Roderick Williamson, the senior corner, picks it off with a solid return as well. That's a big play for TCU because everything in this game has gone really horribly for the Horn Frogs within the opening few minutes. So for them to force a turnover, maybe they can get some momentum off of this and start to get things rolling. Yorker Shire with a good throw to the sideline. It's caught by the All-American tight end Mario Homeler, a projected first-round pick in this year's draft. I voted Homeler to win the Mackey Award, the best tight end in the country. He ended up finishing in third place, however. Yorker Shire with a nice gain of 18 on the option. He's a really good runner of the football. He can also throw it as well. And then here on second and goal, after a really long and sustained drive, the sophomore running back, Harry Stewart, will punch it in for a touchdown. So the big turnover leads to a big touchdown for TCU, and the Horn Frogs are right back in the game as we are tied at seven. Following Cal possession, Motley is sacked on third down. The defensive tackle, Big Perk Thorncraw, is there making the play. So that'll force a punt. Everything went horribly for TCU in the first couple of minutes, and now everything is going great for them. Harry Stewart breaking tackles up the middle. He gets around 12. The Horn Frogs are really figuring things out. They're running the ball really well. They're getting in some good passes here and there as well as we move to the second quarter. It's a read option on third and one, but the Cal defense reads the play like a book with four guys in the backfield. Thomas Curtis, for one credited with the tackle, he already has seven tackles in this ball game. So that'll bring out the field goal unit looking to put TCU on top for the first time today. The kick is good, and the Horn Frogs now lead 10-7. That'll bring out the Cal offense. They really started off well, but the turnover has kind of stunted everything they had going for them. First down from around the 36. Motley looks to throw it in traffic, and it's picked off again. Roderick Williamson with his second interception of the ball game. The senior corner really trying to boost his draft stock, currently being looked at as a late day three pick. But if he keeps this up, he very well could raise his stock. Man, he is off to a good start. So now TCU has all the momentum. Third and four, Yorkshire goes short. Caught by Jason Bell, who only gets three. Nice tackle by Marcus Clayton, amongst others, bringing the receiver down. Both defenses, I think, have been pretty good for the most part today. We'll see if Cal's offense can respond and try to get the lead back. Third and ten, Motley under pressure. It's a screen for Harrison Myers, and he loses six. Nowhere to go as he's wrapped up by Maurice Spence, the senior defensive end. So TCU has it back. Here is Yorkshire sacked on the play by Marcus Clayton for a loss of three. Both teams have really good front sevens, and both of these front sevens look fantastic today. Third down and long, Yorkshire looks to throw it, takes a shot deep downfield, and it is caught by Cameron Lewis for a gain of 50. What a throw by Sterling Yorkshire and an unbelievable grab by Cam Lewis. Third and goal, Yorkshire looks for the end zone, but it's broken up in the secondary. Good work by the Cal defense to keep it a one-score game as TCU has to kick the field goal, making it 13-7. So Cal's offense now is the ball trailing by six. Their offense has got to get something going again. They've been really quiet over these last few drives as it's another screen for Myers, and again it doesn't work as he loses six more, this time wrapped up by Kamani Battle. So TCU's going to get it back, trying to make it a two-score lead going into halftime. The Horn Frogs offense is really starting to get comfortable with this game as Yorkshire takes off running, breaks a tackle, and is out of bounds for a gain of 12, stopping the clock and moving the chains. Yorkshire, for the most part, looks pretty good today. He hasn't made many big-time throws other than the one on the last drive to Cam Lewis, but he's been pretty solid, and that's a great throw over to Jason Bell for 21 yards, threading the needle perfectly towards the sideline. Now third and four. Yorkshire rolls out to the right, and he is stopped shy, fumbles the ball, and it is quickly picked up by Cam Lewis. Good awareness by the junior receiver to quickly scoop up the ball, but 
TCU is still shy of the first down marker, so the field goal unit is back. The kicker is now 3-for-3 three three today. He's been awfully busy. As the Horned Frogs lead 16-7 to seven going into halftime. Over the first few minutes of this game, Cal absolutely dominated. But ever since the first interception by Roger Williamson, it has gone downhill for them. TCU has scored 16 unanswered, and they start with the ball here in the third quarter. Second and 10, Yorkshire goes short. Pass is caught by Jason Bell for a gain of 11. TCU continuing to really move the ball very efficiently here in this game. Third and seven, Yorkshire alone in the backfield looking to throw it. Goes short. Pass is caught, but well shy of the first down as Chaz Butler only gains three. So the field goal unit returns. The kicker three for three today. Why not make it four for four? He has been a busy fella today as TCU now leads 19-7. Cal's got to get something going at some point, right? Motley goes downfield. It's caught by Matamuto Damba, and he is gone. Untouched into the end zone for a 74-yard touchdown, and the Golden Bears are back in the game. What a great throw by Motley. Damba completely blows by the corner, and the Cal Golden Bears are right back in this ball game as they are now only down by five points. Great play by Motley and Damba, and things really just got interesting. Cal's offense was on a major cold spell before that play. Now they're starting to feel themselves a little bit more, but they still trail. TCU with it back. Yorkshire on first down, goes short, passes caught for a solid gain of 11 by the backup tight end, Josh St. George, a former five-star recruit who's going to be the full-time starter next year with Mario Hummeler in the NFL. Second and seven, Yorkshire's picked off. Matt Marshall with the interception for the Cal defense, and things are really starting to turn in favor of the Golden Bears. They were really starting to struggle, but they get the big touchdown. Now they get a turnover, and now they can take the lead on this possession. Rufus Motley scrambles to the right, fumbles it, and it's picked up by TCU. Are you kidding me? So Cal gets the ball for one play, and Motley fumbles it. The senior linebacker, Matumbe Afolabe, delivers a big hit. Clearly a fumble. Motley has now turned it over three times today. Good recovery there by number 21, Jeremy Hart, a projected second to third rounder in this year's draft. So TCU gets it back, third and three. Harry Stewart is just shy of the first down marker. What does TCU do on fourth and one? They would elect to punt it. Interesting call. They were past the 50. So Cal gets it back with another opportunity to take the lead. Both teams just trading the football at this point. Motley with a strike downfield, and it's caught inside the red zone. A nice gain by Eberly Keltstan, who had the big touchdown last week to really start things off for Cal, although he's been kind of quiet today. Third and goal. Motley keeps it himself. He is in for a touchdown, and Cal takes the lead. But there's one problem. There is a flag on the play. It's a holding call against Andrew Barnett, the backup tight end. That'll move Cal back 10 yards. The touchdown taken off the board as TCU keeps their lead. On third and goal, it's a screen for Harrison Myers. Breaks a tackle, but doesn't get more than a yard or two. Good stop by the Horn Frog defense, and it looks like TCU will hold on to the lead as Cal will make the field goal, and it is now 19-17. to Only a two-point game here late in the third quarter as we now move over to quarter number four. Which side will take this game and advance to the semifinals? Second and seven, Yorkshire keeps it on the read option. Sterling Yorkshire with blocks! Down the field! He will take it all the way for a 61-yard rushing touchdown. And Sterling Yorkshire has the Horn Frogs up by nine. What a run by the senior quarterback. And now it's back to the drawing board for Cal. Fumble picked up by Cal quickly. Jojo Adiamoa was the one with the fumble force. The only non-senior starter on this defense. Adiamoa is a true sophomore. But despite being the young kid on this defense, he's been one of their best defensive players throughout the entire season, and he makes a huge play even though Cal picks up the fumble. Still a loss of yardage. Third and 15, Motley's going to take a shot downfield, and it is broken up in the secondary by Chaz Fogel. Cal would punt it. TCU pretty much can ice the game here. Is on first down. Yorkshire tries to make another play on the ground, but he is sacked by Marcus Clayton, who now has two sacks in this ball game forcing a loss of five. Now third and 16 here for TCU. Cal knows they got to get a stop or else they could be in trouble. TCU is just going to run the ball with Harry Stewart, and he gets nothing. 
Quick work by the Cal defense, so they'll get it back. Again, a nine-point game, but as you can see, this clock is ticking under five minutes to go. Harrison Myers with the ball up the middle of a good run for about 13 yards. We've got to see Rufus Motley really play like he did against Notre Dame because for the most part, he has not looked anywhere near as good today as he has against the Irish, but he can change that with a big comeback or a nice run like that as he gets 10 yards, again, moving the chains nicely. Third and eight here for Cal, under three minutes to go now. Motley looks to throw it with a strike downfield, and it is caught inside the 15 by Everly Keltstan for a gain of 15. Now third and four here for Cal on the goal line. Motley looks to throw it, evades for pressure, scrambles to the right, and this ball is out. It's a fumble picked up by Roderick Williamson. Motley has now turned it over four times today. Two interceptions in the first half, two fumbles in the second half, and that one might clinch the game for the Horn Frogs. That was number 35, Wood, laying down the wood, forcing possibly the clinching fumble to send TCU to the Final Four. All they've got to do is finish off this drive, and they should be fine. Third and four, Horn Frogs up by nine, under two to go. Yorker Shire looks to throw it, and he's just going to throw it away. So Cal's going to get the ball back, but they still need a lot to happen with one timeout, down by nine, third and seven. Motley looks to throw it, has plenty of time, takes a shot deep, and it is caught inside the 10 by Sean Whitmore for a gain of 39. Following play now, first and goal. Can Cal get back into the end zone, really kicking themselves for the fumble on the last drive? Motley with a strike, and it's caught by Maranuto Damba for the touchdown. Damba has caught two passes today, and both of them have ended up in the end zone. So it comes down to an onside kick, and it is quickly recovered by TCU. Fittingly, Mario Homeler, probably the best player on this team, picks it up. And that's all she wrote. TCU is moving on to the Final Four as they defeat Cal 26-24. This ended up being a really fun, competitive game, The momentum constantly swaying. It felt like TCU was in control for most of this game, but Cal was always in it until the end. Rufus Motley had some good plays and he had some bad plays, but I will say Cal should be very encouraged with their young quarterback. Overall, I thought he has performed well here in the playoffs. They certainly missed Marquette Collins. You got to ask if he was healthy and played today, would they have won? I mean, there's certainly a chance that could have happened. Their defense wasn't bad. I don't think there's one set reason that Cal lost other than maybe the turnovers. Because the offense wasn't bad, the defense wasn't bad. They didn't play badly at all today. So Cal's got to end their season hanging their hats high, but they were unable to get the better of Sterling, Yorkershire, and TCU. Yorkershire was a little disappointing as a passer today, but as a runner, he was really impressive. TCU's offense didn't wow me, but they were more than good enough to get the win. They got to be better in the red zone, though. They kicked four field goals in this game. They got to do a better job of finding the end zone. They only scored two touchdowns today. Uh, their defense, for the most part, was also really good as well. Their offensive playmakers did a good job. Although Mario Hummeler needs to catch the ball more than twice. I mean, he's their best player and one of the best players in the country. I don't know why he didn't get the ball more. But overall, a good win. And TCU will be facing off against the winner of the Rose Bowl, either Ohio State or Florida, in the top four. Let's move on to the Orange Bowl now. We get our first look at the top-ranked team in the country, the Clemson Tigers, as they hope to keep their undefeated season alive against the University of Oregon. The Ducks made the playoffs as an at-large bid, grabbing the number eight seed, and they had a really nice win over Michigan in the first round at home in Eugene. The game was very close, tied at 24 at halftime, but just like their regular season matchup with these two teams, Oregon steamrolled in the second half, outscoring Michigan 24 to nothing and route to a 48 to 24 victory as the Ducks are moving on to face off against Clemson here at the Orange Bowl. I think Oregon could give Clemson a really tough test today because the Ducks are loaded with talent on both sides of the ball and the resume speaks for itself. This is undoubtedly one of the probably five or six best teams in the country. They have a very explosive offense. We know Barrett Cherokee is a total stud. Noel Hilaire out of the backfield is awesome. 
And then their defense, I mean, they were not good in the first half against Michigan, but they flipped the switch in the second half and were phenomenal. The pass rush really stepped up in the second half of that game, so if they can create pressure for Cade Hutchinson, they could win. If the defense struggles to create pressure against Cade, I don't think Oregon's got a shot because in structure, Cade Hutchinson is unbelievable, whether it's as a thrower, as a runner. There's a reason why Cade Hutchinson won the Heisman Trophy. He's been the best player in the country this year. But this team is not just about Cade Hutchinson. They are loaded across the board. Obviously, Cade is the leader. He's their best player. He's This team's going to go as far as he takes them, but they've got plenty of offensive playmakers. Kobe Henderson, Latrell McAllister, Jordan Jones, Xavier Mayo, all studs. Their defense is filled with a bunch of future NFL players. This has been the best team in college football this season, and I don't think it can really be argued. They were the only team to finish undefeated. They dominated most of their opponents. The last time we saw them, they dominated Duke in the ACC championship. But Clemson has not faced off against a team as good as the Oregon Ducks this year. So it's certainly going to be a challenge. But this is kind of a home game for Clemson. Being the number one seed, they got to choose which bowl game they wanted. The Orange Bowl is, you know, closest to Clemson. So I expect to see a lot of orange in the stands today. But I think the Ducks are going to be up for the task. And I think this is going to be a really fun matchup. Welcome to the Orange Bowl here as the Clemson Tigers, the number one overall seed in the college football playoff, face off against the number eight overall seed, the Oregon Ducks of the Big Ten, coming off a nice win against Michigan. The Clemson Tigers are rocking their all-purple jerseys today. That's pretty fun. We'll get to see Kate Hutchinson in purple and get used to it because the Minnesota Vikings have the number one pick this year. So we're probably going to see him in purple a whole lot going forward. Hutchinson starts on the read option, breaks a tackle. Ooh, if he didn't step out of bounds, he could have taken that all the way. But still, a huge start for Kate Hutchinson, gaining 23 yards. Hutchinson keeps it again. What 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 was that? He, he kept it and then just stood there and then lost four. What, what was he trying to do there? Second and ten. Hutchinson goes short, caught by Xavion Mayo, the senior receiver, breaking tackles. Great play after the catch by Mayo as he gets 15 yards. So far, for the most part, the Tigers' offense looks really solid here on this opening possession. Third and 10, Hutchinson looks to throw it in the back of the end zone, broken up by Mike Jamison, who had the big pick six in the first round against Bartholomew Blunt and Michigan as the Tigers kick the field goal and they lead 3-0. So here comes the Oregon offense led by the explosive duo of Barrett Cherokee and Noel Hilaire as Cherokee keeps it himself, breaking tackles for a quick gain of about 15. Cherokee ran it really well against Michigan and with this Oregon team they obviously have a very talented quarterback who really can throw the football but this is a team who specializes on running it and their quarterback in particular really can run that ball. Cherokee down the field gets 35 yards. A quick start here for the junior. Barrett Cherokee looking to up his draft stock as possibly a pretty high pick at quarterback in next year's draft. is on first and goal. He will scramble into the end zone for a touchdown. All that drive was about for Oregon was Barrett Cherokee running the ball himself. And Clemson is trailing. They have not trailed a whole lot this year. Hutchinson on first down is sacked by Raleek Akintola who was dominant in the second half against Michigan. Truly a game wrecker on third and two. The backup running back, Chugalomoklo, gets 11, however, keeping the chains moving. And then on third and four, Hutchinson throws it in the back of the end zone. So Clemson's had two pretty good drives, but neither of them have resulted in a touchdown. Oregon's been able to get a couple red zone stops. Clemson has to kick a field goal. And so Oregon will stay on top, seven to six, as the Ducks get it back late in the first. Barrett Cherokee keeps it again. He has been dicing this Clemson defense up with his legs as he gets another first down hit hard for a gain of 11. Oregon now has it at the 25. First down under a minute in the quarter. Cherokee now looks to throw it, goes up the middle, and has Oregon in the red zone. It's Tommy Porter for a gain of 12. Oregon now at the 12. They would eventually get in a first and goal situation as Mason Tartle, the backup running back, will go into the end zone for a touchdown. And wow, Oregon's offense looks great so far. They lead 14 to 6. Clemson gets it back, looking to answer. Is on first down. It's a handoff up the middle for Kobe Henderson, the senior, coming off an Achilles tear last year. Henderson has improved each week throughout this year, and he really looks like his old self before the injury. 
Third and 12. It's a screen out of the backfield. That's Chigalamoklo, the backup running back, who breaks a tackle, wrapped up well short of the first down yards marker. But there's a penalty, and it's on Clemson. It's a clipping penalty. So Oregon would ultimately elect to decline the call, and so Clemson will probably have to bring the field goal back out onto the field here now to start the second quarter. Fourth and seven. The kicker's been a busy man. He's two for two. Can he add another one? Yes, he will. The Tigers have had three drives today, and they've all ended in field goals. 14-9, to nine, Oregon still on top. Both of their drives have ended in touchdowns today. Cherokee on third and seven keeps it himself, breaks a tackle, but it's still stopped a couple yards shy of the first down marker, so Clemson gets a stop. Oregon will bring the field goal team on. This kick from around 55, and it is no good. I think it had the distance. But it was wide to the left, so Oregon is unable to score. It's our first possession of the game without points. Yeah, that definitely had the distance. It had the distance maybe from another seven or eight yards back, but it just wasn't accurate. So now Clemson has it back, trailing by five. Hutchinson with a strike downfield for Zevion Mayo. That's a touchdown, and the Clemson Tigers take the lead as it is now 16-14. to Great throw by Hutchinson. Now Oregon's going to look to respond. Here's a nice run up the middle by Noel Hilaire. Breaking tackles. He gets around 17. This has been a really high-octane, explosive game so far. Oregon is matching Clemson's offense in this one. Big hit there on Cherokee, making it a third and seven. DeAndre Herring with the tackle for loss. He's been all over the field today for the Clemson defense. But on third down, Cherokee connects with Tommy Porter, who gains 14, getting the first. Second and two, here's Mason Tartle. Breaks a tackle. Tartle with a first down, fighting forward for a gain of 10. And Oregon is getting very close to this end zone. Second and goal. Cherokee looks to throw it under pressure. Breaks a couple of tackles, but he is still sacked. A couple of yards shy of the line of scrimmage. It's Justin Smith who brings him down. Now third and goal. Cherokee rolls out to the right, and he will run it in before getting leveled in the end zone for a touchdown. And Oregon will get back on top. Barrett Cherokee continuing his dominant first half. I mean, Ohio State's defense is a little bit better than Clemson's, but it's been a night and day difference with Barrett Cherokee. He really struggled against Ohio State, and here against Clemson, he is balling. Clemson's offense is also balling. Here's your Heisman Trophy winner, Kate Hutchinson, with a big run of about 25 yards. Hutchinson's legs have been really good today. I know Barrett Cherokee has been more dominant as a runner. Hutchinson's running it well, too, and he's also throwing it well as it's Jordan Jones, the senior wideout, who gets 24. Jones is a little bit raw, but he's super big, super fast, very intriguing NFL prospect. Third and goal. Hutchinson connects in the back of the end zone with his tight end. Latrell McAllister, the projected first-round pick, with the touchdown, and Clemson is back on top, 22-21. That's Kate Hutchinson's second touchdown of the game. And by the way, he has now broken the record for the most touchdowns in a single player's career in FBS history. Barrett Cherokee throws it away on third down. Clemson gets it back. So they return with their record-setting quarterback, Kate Hutchinson, looking to get right back to work as he connects with Jordan Jones for a game of 28. Clemson's really starting to get some momentum here late in the first half. We'll see if they can add some more points before halftime. Hutchinson, under pressure, gets it over to Latrell McAllister, who gets it into the red zone. Man, Kate Hutchinson looks comfortable right now. He is throwing the ball with ease, really looking like a Heisman Trophy winner and a future number one pick. Hutchinson on first down, loses it. It's a fumble picked up by Clemson. That could have been bad news for the Clemson offense, but luckily they had their right guard, Griffith Zagaran, right there to recover it. Third and 14, short passes caught just shy of the first down marker. Good job after the catch by Kion Cordell, but he was tackled a couple yards short by the senior corner, Caleb Kaufman, who played great against Michigan and has also been really good today. Clemson kicks the field goal. Their kicker is 4 for 4 on field goals. Them and the TCU kicker have been awfully busy today. 26-21 here at the half. It's been a really exciting game, and I have a feeling it's only going to get better here in the second half. The Ducks start with the ball. Good throw to start things off by Cherokee over to Amante Rogers. Rogers had a big touchdown in the win last week against Michigan in the first round. Third and 12. Cherokee, calm and composed, launches a strike, but it's out of bounds. Ezekiel Ayutondo, the tight end, caught it, but was unable to get a foot in. 
So Clemson has it back. On third down, Hutchinson launches a prayer downfield. Broken up by Caleb Kaufman, who continues to be a force at corner. He has played fantastic in both playoff games, and his stock is very clearly on the rise. Here comes Oregon, a nice run by Barrett Cherokee. The Ducks are throwing the ball pretty well, but they're trying to get back to their roots of running the football with number one, making plays as he trucks a defender. What a run by Barrett Cherokee, still on his feet. He will not go down, and it is eventually wrapped up, but after gaining 36 yards, my lord, is Barrett Cherokee dominating. First and goal, Mason Tartle with his second touchdown of the game. And the Ducks are back on top. 27-26. Got to assume Oregon's going to go for two, and they will. Looking to make it a clean three-point game, and they got it. Mason Tartle with the two-point conversion. I'm surprised Tartle's gotten pretty much as many, if not more, snaps than their main running back, Noel Hilaire. I don't really know why that is. 26-29, Clemson has it back. Hutchinson downfield for Mayo, who gets 56. What a play by Kate Hutchinson, connecting with his number one wide receiver, Xavion Mayo, and then on first and goal. Hutchinson, what was that? He lateraled it like five yards backwards. He did the old-fashioned Jacoby Myers, and Clemson turns it over into the red zone. We have applauded Kate Hutchinson all year for being so poised, so accurate, so consistent, so smart. That that was so dumb. Oregon gets it back after the first defensive turnover of the game as Cherokee connects with his younger brother, Maverick Cherokee, for a gain of 12. Third and five, Barrett Cherokee goes short on the screen. First down and more down the field. It's Hilaire inside the 15. Again, a 39 yards for Noel Hilaire on the screen. Now a third and three. Cherokee keeps it himself, and he is tackled shy of the end zone. Big play there by the unsafety Alec Padfield. And that'll wrap up the third quarter. The Oregon Ducks lead by three. They're about to extend their lead, probably with a field goal. Oregon is one quarter away from shocking the college football world and upsetting number one Clemson. Can they do it? Well, they do make the field goal, so now they lead by six. Still a one-score game. Clemson is far from out of it, everybody. So the Tigers have it back. Here's a handoff up the middle. Good gain for Kobe Henderson as he gets around 12, moving the chains here for the Tigers. This is Kate Hutchinson's most important quarter of his life, but so far the ground game is really what's getting Clemson moving. Another good run there by Kobe Henderson as he gets 11. Third and eight. Hutchinson looks to throw it with a strike downfield. It's caught by Jordan Jones, who is out of bounds near the 10-yard line. So far, so good here on this possession for the Tigers. First and 10. Hutchinson keeps it on the read option. Finds holes, has blocks. Touchdown, Clemson. A big drive for the Tigers leads to a rushing touchdown by the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, Cade Hutchinson. And it is now 33-32 as Clemson takes the lead with the PAT. Now it's time for Oregon to respond. Can Barrett Cherokee lead his team down the field? Now that's not a good start as they lose four on the screen to Noel Hilaire. Second and 14 now for the Ducks. Time is ticking here in the fourth quarter under six and a half minutes to go as Cherokee is tackled behind the line of scrimmage again. DeAndre Herring once again, the veteran middle linebacker, makes the play. Third and long. Cherokee looks to throw it off his balance, and he is incomplete. So Clemson's defense gets a stop. They'll get it back on offense, looking to extend the lead. Third and eight. Hutchinson stumbling forward, and he does not get the first down. A couple yards shy. Good stop by the Oregon defense, and Clemson's going to kick. They are going to go for a 57-yard field goal instead of a fourth and two, and that backfires. The kick is no good. And so Oregon will get it back, still only down by one with great field position. Again, that kick had the distance, but it was not accurate. Wide to the left. We'll see if Oregon can take the lead. Second and six. Cherokee up the middle with a nice throw. Caught by Zach Ray for a gain of 15. Oregon's moving in nicely. Can they take the lead? Under two and a half to go. It's Tartle inside the 10 to the five. A big run for the Ducks. All they've got to do is bunch it in. First and goal, Cherokee scrambles to the right, looking to break tackles, diving in, and he's just short. But now he has it at the one. Second and goal now for Oregon. Under 2.10 to go. Cherokee on the read option. Touchdown, Oregon. 
Barrett Cherokee puts the Ducks ahead late in the ball game. Now they're probably going to go for two. Look to make it a clean seven-point lead. And if they can do that, they'll find themselves in a pretty comfortable position. So they look to finish off the upset. Here's the two-point try. Cherokee looks to throw it, kind of scramble again. And fittingly, he runs it in. So Cherokee gets the two-point conversion. And it's now 40 to 33. So this is the most important drive in the young career of Cade Hutchinson. Can he lead his team down the field with under two minutes to go to tie the game up? Third and ten. Xavion Mayo only gets nine. Big stop by the Oregon defense. And so that'll make it a fourth and one. This could be the ball game. If Clemson doesn't get it, they're in big trouble. Let's see what the play call is. Hutchinson keeps it on the read option, and he gets it, and then some pass for 45 for a gain of 12. Good run there for Kate Hutchinson to keep the drive going. Now second and one. Clemson trying to hold on to their all timeouts as they still have all three of them. Hutchinson sails it for the sideline. It's caught by Mayo, who is wrapped up past the 30. And Clemson surprisingly uses their first time out there. I feel like that's odd timing since with the first down, they stop the clock until everybody's back out of the huddle. Second and 10. Hutchinson looking downfield. A strike into the hands of Ryan Bell, who catches it for 18 yards. Clemson calls timeout number two. Now a third and seven with 30 seconds to go. Hutchinson rolls out to the right, looks to throw it, passes, caught for a touchdown! Robert Henry, the fullback, with the go-ahead touchdown, and the Clemson Tigers are an extra point away from tying the game. The kick is up, and it is good. 40-40 to 40 with 25 seconds left. So Oregon, with all three timeouts, they very well can still score. Cherokee scrambles with it under pressure and is sacked. Oregon cannot afford to make mistakes. They cannot turn the ball over here. Maybe on third down, you just figured maybe run out the clock, make Clemson burn a timeout, just go into overtime. Cherokee's going to nearly be intercepted. DeAndre Herring had the game right in his hands. You got to catch that. So now Clemson's going to get it back. There's exactly one second on the clock after the punt return. They're going to try to run a Hail Mary to win the game in regulation. Hutchinson in the pocket. Takes a shot. Downfield. And it is caught for a touchdown! Jordan Jones wins it for the Tigers at the buzzer. And Clemson walks it off in unbelievable fashion. A game-winning Hail Mary from Kate Hutchinson to Jordan Jones, and the Clemson Tigers are going to the semifinals in the most ridiculous ending I think I have ever seen. Pure shock on the Oregon sideline, while the Clemson guys are like, yeah, we've been there, nothing new. But holy hell, Clemson with an unbelievable win at the buzzer to defeat the Oregon Ducks 47-40. to Wow! What a game. Oregon stood stride for stride the entire time. But Clemson was clutch with two touchdowns in the last 24 seconds, including the Hail Mary by Kate Hutchinson over to Jordan Jones. Both offenses dominated. Clemson with nearly 700 total yards. Oregon's offense great as well. So Kate Hutchinson, uh, yeah, he's pretty good. Uh, he sure looked like the Heisman Trophy winner, all right. 27-37, 441, four touchdowns, not to mention 120 rushing yards and a touchdown. Yeah, he's going to be the number one pick to the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, all of Clemson's top receivers were really good. Mayo was phenomenal. Jordan Jones, of course, with the game-winning Hail Mary. Uh, the defense wasn't great, but they got stops late when they needed to in order to win the game. As for the Oregon offense, Barrett Cherokee, he is a playmaker. He threw the ball fine, but his running ability is really what stood out. 211 yards and three touchdowns. I don't really know why Noel Hilaire only got 11 carries. That feels kind of stupid. They should have given him the ball more because he's really good. And, well, yeah, I still don't know what to say. I'm completely shocked by the outcome of this game. Oregon's defense kind of blew it at the end. I mean, they stood with him the entire game. But unfortunately for the Ducks, they were unable to complete the shocking upset. And so Clemson is moving on. And the Tigers will face off against the winner of the Sugar Bowl right here between number four seeded Middle Tennessee State and number five seeded Oklahoma. Tigers are coming off a big win in Norman last week, 52 to 38 against Houston. The Cougars offense really gave Oklahoma a tough test. 
that their defense could not stop junior quarterback Romeo Colochi. Oklahoma's playing their best football here down the stretch, and I would not be surprised to see them make a real run for this title with how they've been playing. The Sooners have scored at least 50 points in their last four games. Romeo Colochi has been on fire. All of these playmakers are dominating. Everything is going seemingly really well for Oklahoma, and despite being the lower seed, I do feel like they are the favorite to win this game here against Middle Tennessee State. So far, we have not had any lower seeds win. All six games we've watched so far, the higher seeded team has won. So it'll be interesting to see if Oklahoma can change that or if we'll have our first true upset with the higher seed actually winning, which is ironic. Oklahoma's defense is solid. They did allow 38 points last week, but this team is about the offense, the quarterback, the playmakers. But they're going to have a tough test with this Middle Tennessee State team who has on a finished business. Last year, Middle Tennessee State made our four-team college football playoffs as the number two seed going undefeated in the regular season. They lost in the semifinals by only three points to the eventual national champion Georgia Bulldogs as they allowed six touchdowns to running back Patolomayo Maluwalu in that game. Middle Tennessee State went 12-1 this year. They only lost one game, which was against Navy back in Week 9. Other than that, it's been smooth sailing this year for the Blue Raiders. They've got a really, really talented group of a lot of returning players from last year and some new guys, including quarterback Drain Ignatius, who, like Romeo Colochi, has improved every single week as a starter. They've got plenty of talent on offense. Their defense, statistically, is one of the best in the country, but they have not had to play an offense like Oklahoma. They have not had to play against a player like Romeo Colochi yet. So this is going to be Middle Tennessee State's defense toughest test of the season by far, and we'll see if they truly are deserving of this number four seed since they were assigned the Sugar Bowl, it's almost kind of a home game for Oklahoma. And with them being a bigger national brand as well, you're going to see a lot more red in the stands than blue. So it'll be interesting to see how that really affects things here in the Mercedes-Benz Superdome in New Orleans, home of the Saints. The number five seeded Oklahoma Sooners facing off against the number four seeded Middle Tennessee State Blue Raiders for a spot in the college football semifinals. And again, the winner will play against the top seeded Clemson Tigers, who just had a miraculous victory moments ago on a game winning Hail Mary against the Oregon Ducks. So Oklahoma will start with the ball. Here's Romeo Colochi on first down up the middle. Nice throw. Pass is caught by Matt Montgomery for a gain of 16. Obviously, Bryce Berry, the third, the top projected wide receiver off the board, is the main playmaker here, but they've got plenty of other good receivers like Montgomery, Eric Denman, Noah Hampton, tight end Justin Bruno, and of course, running back Darion Seals. On second down, Kolochi is sacked by Kenneth McGill, the senior linebacker, for a loss of yardage, and that'll make it a third and 16 here for the Sooners. Kolochi looks to throw. It has time, but is wrapped up in the pocket again for another sack. This time, it's Joshua Thompson who makes the play. Good start for the Blue Raider defense, forcing a punt, and they'll get it here on offense. On third down, Drain Ignatius fumbles the ball, and it's picked up by Oklahoma. That's Max Shergs, number nine, who rips away the ball. Shergs was phenomenal against Houston. He had the task of covering wide receiver Kramer Gildeford in that game. Gildeford was the best receiver in college football this year, and he finished with zero receiving yards. So clearly, Max Shergs did something right in that game, and he's already making a play here in this one, looking to improve his draft stock. Oklahoma now the chance to score a touchdown off the turnover. Third and goal. Kolochi sends it for the end zone, and it is broken up. Justin Bruno, the intended target. So Middle Tennessee State gets the stop and will only surrender a field goal as the kick is up and good. And it is now a 3-0 lead for the Sooners. So Middle Tennessee State gets it back. Hand off the middle for Brent. He fumbles it. But Middle Tennessee State recovers. It's Hartman who picks it up. The linebacker, Brigham Bell, forced it. That was a third down, so they would have to punt anyway. As Oklahoma has it. Here's Darion Seals with a big run to around the 50-yard line for a nice gain. Keeping the chains moving as we now advance to the second quarter. Oklahoma leads 3-0. No touchdowns yet. Why not change that here? It's Bryce Perry in the back of the end zone for a score. And Oklahoma will take a 10-0 lead. Great throw by Kolochi over to Bryce Berry. This duo has been unbelievable all year. They were incredible against Houston. And now they're making a play here against Middle Tennessee State. 
to take a double digit lead. If Oklahoma can keep this momentum rolling, I think they should be able to win this game. Middle Tennessee State's got to start making some plays on offense. Third and 11. Ignatius is sacked on the play. Adrian Moore with the hit. And so far, Oklahoma's defense looks dominant. The Blue Raider offense just looks overmatched right now. Oklahoma has it back. Second and 10. Kolochi with a nice throw. That'll be a first down as it's caught once again by Matt Montgomery, who will likely be the Sooners' number one wide receiver next year, with, of course, Bryce Berry probably going to be a top 10 to 15 pick in the draft. Downfield pass is caught inside the red zone by the tight end, Justin Bruno, who gets 29. Romeo Colochi started the day a little bit slowly, but he's really getting a rhythm. And then on third and nine, it is caught, but shy of the end zone as the Middle Tennessee State defense gets a stop. That was Seals who made the catch. Fourth and one, Oklahoma's going to go for it. Gutsy call, Colochi going to look to throw it, and it is caught. Bryce Berry the third with his second touchdown of the game. Although on that play, Barry got a little bit shaken up as he was tackled in the end zone. His status for the rest of today's game is questionable. That could be pretty bad for Oklahoma. Ignatius fumbles it again. Middle Tennessee State picks it up once more. But again, that was on third down. The Blue Raider offense continues to struggle. And this game could be trending towards a blowout if something doesn't change quick. Third and six. Pass is caught, but... Uh, not for long, staying in bounds is Seals, so Oklahoma has to punt it. Can this be where Middle Tennessee State finally scores? Ignatius on first down, goes downfield, nice throw. Caught by Matt Burnett for a gain of 25 yards. Following play, Ignatius has time. He goes over to his running back, Barrington Britt, who breaks a tackle, and Britt has it inside the 25. Good play after the catch there by Middle Tennessee State to keep the drive moving. First and 10, Ignatius with another good throw. This time it's Nehemiah Dalton who gets 16 as the Blue Raiders call a timeout. Second and goal. Can Middle Tennessee State finally find the end zone here, put themselves back in the game? Yes, they do. It's Barrington Britt with the touchdown, 17-7. To Oklahoma now looking to score here late in the first half as Kolochi is picked off. Eric Lilly with the interception, and the tides of this game are really starting to turn a little bit. Oklahoma was dominant through the first quarter and a half, but now Middle Tennessee State is really figuring some things out on both sides of the ball, and now they can make it a one-score game here on this drive. Third and nine, Ignatius' pass is caught by Burnett, but shy of the first down marker. Good stop by the Oklahoma defense, and that'll bring us to halftime. 17-7, Oklahoma on top. The Sooners have definitely been the better team today, but this game is far from over. Middle Tennessee State starting to play some better football, as to start the second half, it's Nehemiah Dalton Jr. for a gain of 14 yards. The Blue Raiders are marching down the field. They now have it inside the 30. Third and 10. Ignatius with a strike. What a catch. Laying out to catch the football as the Blue Raiders now have it at the 5. First and goal. Ignatius tries to break the sack, but it's still brought down. That's Adrian Moore with his second of the game. Third and goal. Ignatius goes short. Pass is caught. But not in the end zone. It's Jacob Pitts, who only gets five. Good stop by the Oklahoma defense. Middle Tennessee State's only going to kick. I don't think it's a horrible call because now you're making it a one-score game, but I certainly would have thought about going for it because you're that close, only about a yard away from the end zone. So nonetheless, it is a one-score game now, 17-10. to 10. Oklahoma's offense has kind of been on a downswing as of recent as Colochi's going to scramble with it. Romeo Colochi with a first and more sliding at around the 45-yard line for a nice gain. Oklahoma now getting back in a rhythm on offense, but Kolochi is nearly intercepted again on third down. Defender had the pick in his hands, but he dropped it. So that will bring the field goal team out. Oklahoma looking to make it a 10-point game once again. This kick is from around, I would say, 43 yards out. The kick is up, and it is good. So it's now 20 to 10 here, nearing the conclusion of the third quarter. Middle Tennessee State again, still far from out of this game. Third and four here for the Blue Raiders. What do they have in store here? They've got to get some things going on offense still. As Ignatius is rocked in the pocket for a sack. Big play by Gilbert Smith, the projected top 10 pick in this year's draft with the hit in the backfield. So now Oklahoma gets it back. Again, looking to make it a three-score game. It's a third down and three for the Sooners. Kolochi looks to throw it, goes short, and that's going to be a loss of about five. I don't know what Romeo Kolochi was trying to do on that play. So now they're not really in field goal range. They're probably going to have to punt it. 
They would end up punting it. Middle Tennessee State gets it back. Now here in the fourth quarter, trailing 20-10 to 10 with their season on the line. They don't want to be one and done again in the playoff. And that's a good start for the fourth quarter. Nehemiah Dalton could go all the way for a touchdown. And it's a three-point game. What a throw and catch by Ignatius over to Nehemiah Dalton, the standout senior wide receiver. So it is now 20-17 to 17 as Oklahoma only leads by three. The Sooners are going to get it back, still on top. The Middle Tennessee State is really figuring things out. Oklahoma's offense has been pretty bad in the second half, so they've got to get something going because they have been on a downward spiral. First play of the drive, Kolochi looks to throw it, goes short, it is caught. Nice broken tackle by Tyshawn Bankston, the backup running back, who gets around 18 yards on the play. Now from the 40-yard line, Oklahoma moving it pretty well as it is a first and 10. Kolochi hands it off up the middle. Another good run, this time by Darion Seals, who gains around 15 yards. Oklahoma's offense is looking pretty good at the moment. Now second and 10. Kolochi looks to throw it, has all the time in the world, but eventually is sacked. Ezekiel Uwazurike, the senior defensive end, is there with the sack. Now third and long. Kolochi takes a shot downfield, and it is nearly intercepted. Eric Lilly had it in his hands. That was a good route, but the pass was a little bit underthrown. So now Middle Tennessee State can take the lead on this possession. Third and four, short throw for Jacob Pitts, and he is tackled out of bounds, but not before getting 17 yards, again moving the chains. Middle Tennessee's offense continuing to play well here. It's getting pretty close to field goal range. Field goal does tie on first down. Ignatius goes short for Matt Burnett. Again, keeping the chains moving. Ignatius looks really comfortable right now in the pocket. Second and goal. Ignatius keeps it himself. Read option touchdown. And after trailing 17 to nothing early in this game, the Middle Tennessee State Blue Raiders have taken the lead. They have scored 24 of the last 27 points. And now all eyes are on Romeo Colucci and the Oklahoma offense as they look to take the lead. Second and 10, Colucci with a strike downfield. It is caught by Tracy Moore, hit hard, but not before getting the first down. Following play from inside the 35, Colucci looks to throw it, goes short again, and that one is another first down. Back over to Tracy Moore, getting some extra snaps with Bryce Berry's injury. As you can tell, he has not been out for a while. He is not returning to the ball game, unfortunately, for Oklahoma. Second and four now in the red zone. Kolochi goes short, passes caught on the slant route for a touchdown by Eric Denman. So Oklahoma marches down the field. They score the touchdown, and the Sooners are back on top. So now the attention shifts towards Middle Tennessee State. Can their offense respond and take the lead? Third and eight, Ignatius looks to throw it and it is thrown away. He was under a lot of pressure. Nobody was open. Great defense by Oklahoma as Middle Tennessee State would elect to punt it. And now Oklahoma is gonna try to finish this thing off. Second and six, Kolochi's pass is caught. And that one will go into about the 30 yard line by Matt Montgomery. Middle Tennessee State starting to use their timeouts. And now Oklahoma is in a real position where if they can run the ball well, choose some clock, get some first downs, they should be fine. It is a third and 12 now, the game on the line. If Oklahoma converts, it's game over, and they're facing off against Clemson in the semifinals. So Middle Tennessee's season is on the line on this play. Kolochi looks to throw it. It's a screen for Seals, and he gets a couple. Good job to break a tackle, but he's actually not going to get anything. So Middle Tennessee State gets the stop, and now Oklahoma is going to look to take the field goal. Not a gimme. This kick from around 50, and it is good. So Oklahoma takes a six-point lead with about a minute to go. Middle Tennessee State is out of timeouts, but they still have a shot to take the lead. On first down, Ignatius going to take a shot downfield. Pass is caught down the field. That's Luther Luxorus breaks the tackle, and he is in for a touchdown. And Middle Tennessee State is an extra point away from taking the lead. What a play from the Blue Raiders on the first play of the drive. Ignatius connects with Lexorus. And now all they need is this extra point to be on top. Wow, what a play for the Blue Raiders as Oklahoma nearly gets in there to block the kick. But it is good. 31-30. to 30. 
Oklahoma still got their timeouts, and all they need is a field goal. Can Romeo Colucci lead them down the field to win the game? Is on first down, goes deep, and it's picked off. Justin Kaplan with the interception. Kaplan with a big return, and this game looks like it's over. Colucci had a man open, but he underthrew him. That was Barry, who's actually gotten back into the game. I thought he was done. But he's back out there for Oklahoma. He was open. He ran a great route. But Kolochi underthrew the pass. Middle Tennessee State is moving on. They'll play against Clemson in the semifinals. Wow. What a ball game. Middle Tennessee State, after trailing 17 to nothing, comes back. They scored 21 in the fourth, including a late touchdown by Luther Lexerus to win the game. Dran Ignatius was very impressive today. 25 for 30, 390 yards, two touchdowns. He made big-time throws. He was efficient. And I think he'll be able to handle the Clemson defense, even if the Tigers are going to be heavily favored going into that game. Middle Tennessee State's going to give them a run through their money. The offensive skill position players all played well. The defense started off slow, but they made plays as this game went on. The two interceptions by Lilly and Kaplan were both huge. Kaplan's play, the one that ended the game, Romeo Colucci, I don't think was bad. The two interceptions were not good throws. He underthrew both of them. But overall, through the two games that we've watched Romeo Colucci here in the playoffs, I think my stock is up on him. I've been really impressed with him. Obviously not as good today as he was against Houston, but still very solid, very efficient. He made big-time throws. So I think he's really going to open up next year as a Heisman favorite and a likely first-round pick if he returns to school because he is draft-eligible. Darion Seals was solid. He caught the ball nine times, though. I wish Kolochi was a little bit more consistently aggressive in the passing game. Obviously, they were a little bit unlucky with Bryce Berry getting banged up for most of the second half. And if he was in there, I think things could have been different because he truly is a game changer at the wide receiver position. The defense wasn't bad. I don't think you can entirely blame them for the loss. They sent good pressure, but they weren't clutch when they needed to. And then the final game, the Rose Bowl between the number two seeded, the Ohio State University, and the seventh seeded Florida Gators. Florida was the highest voted at large team. They got the number seven seed, and they barely beat Nebraska 14 to 13 in a very ugly defensive battle. If Florida's offense played this badly against Nebraska, I think there is some real concern about how they're going to do against Ohio State. So I would like to see Florida really open up the playbook because particularly in the pass game, most of their passes were within 5 to 10 yards of a line of scrimmage, if not even closer. But this team has been really good this year. They went 10-2. and two. I know Ernie Capillar is capable of making big plays. He just didn't show it in the Nebraska game. I'd like to see Elijah Bryant get the ball more because when he gets the ball, he is a special, special player. And then the defense, they were phenomenal against Nebraska. As for the Ohio State Buckeyes, they went 12-1. They beat Oregon in the Big Ten Championship. Ohio State is the best non-undefeated team in the country, and their resume stacks up pretty evenly with Clemson minus having a loss. Ohio State has dominated most of their opponents. Their defense is unbelievable. Their offense scores plenty of points, and other than Clemson, I think Ohio State has been the best team in college football this year. I mean, again, the resume speaks for itself. Other than a hiccup back in Week 6 against Wisconsin, they've been really good. They blew out Missouri. They blew out Michigan. They blew out Penn State. They blew out Indiana. They blew out Texas. They handled Oregon. Marco Burnley is a very solid senior quarterback. Mookie Davis out of the backfield. He is phenomenal. Chaz Suggs and Auden Green are great at receiver. And then their defense is unbelievable. Of course, led by Jameer Jefferson, a top projected pick in this year's draft at corner. But they've got plenty of other guys as well, like Steve Stifler, who took over in the Big Ten Championship game. Linebacker Elliot Holly, Defensive tackle Hercules Oceanus, who's also a projected first-round pick. So the Buckeyes have plenty of talent on both sides of the ball. And again, if Florida's offense could barely muster up anything against Nebraska, who does have a very good defense, but not as good as Ohio State's. So it'll be interesting to see if Florida changes up the playbook and performs a lot better today against the Buckeyes because I don't see a world where Ohio State only scores 14 points in this game. So Florida's offense is going to respond. 
Welcome to the Rose Bowl here in Pasadena, California. The final quarterfinal playoff game is here. We already know Clemson is playing against Middle Tennessee State in one of the final four matchups. Now we need to see which team will be playing against TCU, who beat Cal in the Fiesta Bowl earlier today. I think of all four matchups, this one might be the most intriguing to me because Florida is the best at-large team in the country, in my opinion, and Ohio State's really strong as well. So I think this will be a very fun game. Florida's going to open up with the football on first down. Capilar looks to throw it. He goes short for the tight end. Brandon Pickens, who annihilates three defenders, still on his feet, wrapped up inside the 35. My goodness, what a play after the catch by Brandon Pickens. Second and three, play action fake. Capilar downfield for Chris Gentry, who gets it to the one. See, kids, when Ernie Capilar actually throws the ball downfield, good things can happen. We did not see really any throws like that in the game against Nebraska, so it's good to see Florida opening up the playbook a little bit. First and goal at the one-yard line. It's a handoff for Elijah Bryant, the All-American running back, projected to go in the first round this year. He scores the touchdown, and Florida strikes first. Let's take a look at the Ohio State offense. It's Mookie Davis, the sophomore running back, breaking tackles. Davis pushed out of bounds, past the 45-yard line. Mookie Davis is a spectacular player. I think when he gets a little bit older, we'll be talking about him as a future Heisman contender. Third and four, good throw by Burnley into the hands of Matthew Mountbatten, who gets it inside the 10. Ohio State doesn't have like a go-to great receiver, but they've got four or five guys who can make plays on the outside and in the slot. Second and goal, Burnley is going to be sacked. Thrown down to the ground by the defense. It's Hawkins who makes the play. Third and goal now for Ohio State. Burnley looks to throw it with all day in the pocket with a strike for the corner. It is caught by Kermit Wiltz for a touchdown. And the Ohio State University ties it at seven. Florida now with it. Elijah Bryant breaking tackles. Bryant still on his feet. Breaks another tackle. Elijah Bryant will go all the way for a Florida touchdown. And the Gators are immediately back on top. I've been raving over Elijah Bryant really since last season for good reason. He's going to be the number one running back off the board in next year's draft class. He is a star. Burnley with a great throw over to Chaz Suggs. Pass for 50. Both of these offenses look really good so far. The complete opposite of Florida's first round game. Ohio State pretty close to the red zone at second and one. Handoff up the middle for Davis. He gets it inside the 10. Good run by the sophomore, Mookie Davis. Second and two. Handoff for the backup running back, Ramir Conwell. He is in for a touchdown, and we are tied up at 14. This game has more points here in the first quarter than the entirety of the Florida-Nebraska game. So Florida gets it back, third and eight. Here's Ernie Capillar dancing in the pocket. He will connect. Nice throw into the hands of Deontay Perkins, the senior wideout, who gets the first down. Ernie Capillar has been much more aggressive today, and it has been really good to see. Now into the second quarter, first and 10. Handoff for Elijah Bryant with a big run. Bryant pass for 30, 25 into the 22. Elijah Bryant on four carries today has over 100 yards and two touchdowns. He is him. Third and two. However, Bryant is stopped shy of the first down marker. Big stop by the Buckeye defense. Fourth and one. Florida keeps the offense out on the field. This is a gutsy call. I'm a little bit surprised they're going for it, but it works out as Ernie Capilar slides for a gain of about six, which moves the chains. Second and goal now for the Gators. Handoff up the middle. Another touchdown by Elijah Bryant. He's got a hat trick, and there are still, like, a lot of time left in the first half. He's already got three touchdowns. Ohio State has it back, but not for long. Burnley is picked off. Donovan Bambo with the interception. That's the first drive of the game not resulting in a touchdown. Which offense is going to break down first? It looks like it's Ohio State. The junior Bambo, a possible first-round pick in the future, comes down with a big interception. A nice return as well after the catch. So because of that, Florida has great field position. 
Third and 12 from the 30. Capillar will look to go for a short screen, caught by Elijah Bryant, who gets a solid gain, but will not get the first down. Good stop by the Buckeye defense, so Florida will not be able to get the touchdown. They'll have to settle for a field goal. Kick is good, and so the Gators lead by 10, 24-14. It's impressive how different the Florida offense looks today. So Ohio State has it back, third and eight. Burnley with a strike downfield. It's caught by Kermit Wiltz. He gets nine, just like his jersey number, which moves the chains. Ohio State now marching towards the goal line. First and goal, Marco Burnley on the read option will run in for the touchdown. And the Ohio State University brings it within three. 24 to 21. Can the Gators score here before halftime? Maybe look to make it a two-score game. Third and eight. Ernie Capillar keeps it himself. Capillar will run for the first and more. Capillar down the field. Takes a big hit past the 45. Huge run by Ernie Capillar. And Florida's offense is continuing to look very impressive here in this game. Making Ohio State's defense look not as good as we've portrayed them to be throughout the entire season. Nebraska is probably sitting at home thinking, how did we stop these guys to only 14 points? On first down, Capilar looks to throw it. Balls out, it's a strip sack. And it's picked up by the Buckeyes. Benjamin Trevino is the one with the strip sack. It was recovered by Jonathan Williams. Let's look at this replay. It was Capilar down by contact. It's awfully close. It's really hard to tell if he was losing control of the ball as he was going down. But ultimately, the officials would review and reverse the fumble. Still a big sack by Ohio State, but a massive turnover taken off the board. So Florida will keep it. Third and eight. Capilar scrambling with it. And Ernie Capilar is just shy of the first down marker as the Buckeyes do get the stop there. And Florida would punt it. Ohio State would run out the clock. 24-21 going into halftime. We've got ourselves a good one here in Pasadena. Let's move over to the second half now with the Buckeyes starting with the ball. It seems like both defenses are really starting to play a little bit better now as Davis loses five on the play. The middle linebacker, Giacomo Vivaro, is there to bring him down. We'll see if both of these defenses can continue to keep up the momentum they've been building is on third down. Burnley goes short, only gets a yard to the tight end, Trey Miller, who is quickly tackled. So now Florida gets it back. Can they make it a two-score game on this drive? Capilar looks to throw it here on third down under pressure. It's caught by Deontay Perkins, but he gets nothing. So the Buckeyes get another stop, and Ohio State gets it back as both of these defenses are continuing to play really well after struggling super early in this game. Third and 11. Burnley goes downfield, and it is broken up in the secondary in and out of the hands of number 21, Yambo Okpoko, the younger brother of former Florida pass rusher Zyrus Okpoko, who, of course, was the number two overall pick last year by the Texans. Capilar fumbles it. This time, I think the ball was clean out. Trevino again with the force, but Florida was there to recover it. Close call. Third and 10. Capilar looks to throw it. Short pass is caught by Louis Deanna Tildes, and he will get the first down. The Florida Gator mascot dancing, fired up as the Gators are starting to move it down the field here. We're finally getting some offense here in the second half. Second down and 11. Capilar under pressure, and he is sacked. Hercules Oceanus is there for the play. One of the top projected defensive tackles in this year's draft, a likely first to second round pick. Third and 18, short screen for Elijah Bryant with room. He is pushed out of bounds by Jameer Jefferson. A couple of first rounders there. Bryant's going to be a high pick. Jefferson, of course, is going to be a very high pick, possibly number two overall, as the field goal is good. So it's 27-21. I'm surprised Florida kicked there. They had it inside, like, the two-yard line. Nonetheless, it is a six-point game now. Ohio State with the ball in the fourth quarter. Burnley breaks a tackle, tries to break another one. He's unsuccessful, but still a good run for Margo Burnley, who I think overall has had a pretty good game today for Ohio State. He sends a screen over to the tight end, Trey Miller, here on third and five. Miller breaking tackles, wrapped up at around the 15 by the middle linebacker, Giacomo Vivaro. Can the Buckeyes take the lead here? Third and two. Handoff, it's going to be Davis. Breaks a tackle, and Mookie Davis is in for a touchdown. And the Ohio State University takes the lead, 28-27. Florida gets it back here, third and 10. Capilar scrambling with it, and he is thrown to the ground by Jonathan Williams for a loss of six. 
So the Gators are going to have to punt it. And now Ohio State finds themselves in a pretty good spot. They lead by one. They had the ball. And they're going to look to extend this lead as Marco Burnley runs deep on the option. Burnley gets around 40 and is wrapped up at the 10-yard line. What a run by Margo Burnley. He's not necessarily the most nimble athlete, but he's a physical, tough runner. And then on second and goal, Mookie Davis with his second touchdown at the quarter. And the Buckeyes have scored 14 unanswered. They lead this game by eight. Florida's going to need a touchdown and a two-point conversion to tie. Can Ernie Capilar and the boys do it? On third and 12, Capilar looks to throw it. Pass is caught by a wide open Brandon Perkins who crushes a defender and brings it to around the 30. Nobody was covering Brandon Perkins and I really don't know why. But, I mean, Florida's not complaining and shout out to Perkins for making another ridiculous play after the catch. What is his break tackle rating? It has to be high because he is crushing opposing defenders. Third and goal for Florida, looking to take the lead. It's a handoff for Bryant, who has scored three times today, and he has stopped short of the end zone. So now Florida's going to have to go for it here on fourth and goal. If they don't get it, it could be the ball game for them. Capilar dances in the pocket. He will look to run for the touchdown, and he does. Ernie Capilar with the score, and Florida is a two-point conversion away from tying it up. Here's the two-point try. Capilar looks to throw it. It is caught by Perkins, who does not get back into the end zone. Elliott Holly with a huge tackle. So now Ohio State leads by two with the ball. All they've got to do is not do anything stupid. Just chew some clock, run the ball, dirt, turn it over, and they turn it over. It's picked off by Giacomo Vavaro, who takes it for a pick six. And Florida takes the lead with not a lot of time to go around two minutes. Giacomo Vivaro is the hero for Florida. I don't know what Marco Burnley was thinking there. You do not throw the ball in that situation. This should be about chewing clock, running the ball. Mookie Davis has been fantastic in the fourth quarter. Give him the rock and let him win this game for you. I don't get what Ohio State was doing there. Florida will again go for two to try to make it a six-point game. They failed on their last two-point try, and they fail again. Capilar sacked out of the end zone by Hercules Oceanus, who has two sacks today. That one is technically a third, but since it's on the two-point conversion, it doesn't count. So it's 39-35. Now Ohio State actually will have to throw the ball for a game-winning drive. Now they're going to run it, ironically enough, and Mookie Davis fumbles the ball, but it's picked up by the offensive guard, Kenny Brewer. That could have been catastrophic for Ohio State. Third and six now. Time is ticking. Ohio State running no huddle, although they do with their timeouts. Burnley takes a shot downfield, and it's overthrown. Incomplete. Good coverage by Florida. This could be it for Ohio State. Fourth and six. Burnley under a lot of pressure. Connects with Kermit Wilkes. Great play by Margo Burnley. He hit a defender quickly in his face and quickly releases it for the first down. Second and five now for the Buckeyes. Under a minute to go. Here is Burnley looking to throw it. Has time. Takes a shot downfield for the sideline. It's caught by Auden Green, who gains 21. Ohio State now has it inside the 15 on first and 10. Burnley scrambles with it under pressure, and he falls backwards for a loss of about 13. A big play for the Florida defense. Now third and 17. Ohio State hurrying back to the line of scrimmage quickly. Burnley looks to throw it, goes short, caught by, oh, it's not caught. Conwell has it ripped away from him. So now it's fourth and 17. This is it. If Ohio State doesn't get it, it's game over. Burnley goes downfield, and it's broken up. Johnny Lee Farr, the All-American safety, deflects it away, and Florida completes the upset. For the first time here in this year's college football playoff tournament, we finally have a lower-seeded team winning. Number seven, Florida upsets the Ohio State Buckeyes, and the Gators are moving on to the semifinals. Wow, what a weird game. In the first half, it was all about offense. In the third quarter, it was all about defense. And then the offenses started to play better in the fourth quarter. And of course, the Giacomo Vivaro pick six completely flipped this game on its back. I don't know what Ohio State was doing in terms of play calling on that play. But this ended up being a really exciting game. So Florida will play against TCU for a spot in the national title game. 
Ernie Capilar was a lot better today than he was against Nebraska. Capilar wasn't perfect today. There are still ways to improve, but he was significantly better. Elijah Bryant only getting 14 carries is a crime, however. They need to give him the ball more because he is the engine of this entire team, as we saw today. In the receiving game, I was impressed with Brandon Pickens. He only caught two passes. They need to get him the ball more, too. And then defensively, not great, but not bad either. And they made plays when they needed to. The Bambo interception was a huge play. Obviously, the Vavaro interception was huge. And then the last drive as well. Marco Burnley, I don't think was bad. He ran it well. He had some good throws. The interception's obviously not ideal. Again, I don't know why their main running back, Mookie Davis, only got 12 carries, though. They need to get the ball to him more, just like Florida needed to with Elijah Bryant. Ohio State's defense was a little disappointing. Not bad, but I expected a little more out of them. So that was something. Four really exciting games, and now we are down to four. Clemson against Middle Tennessee State, and then Florida against TCU. In the next episode, we will wrap up the college football playoff. We'll be going over both semifinal games along with the national championship. All of that in the next episode. I hope you guys are ready. Make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you're new. Peace out.